A man forged by communism who then destroyed it. <laughs> An enemy of the West welcomed as a friend. <laughs> 20 years since he helped to transform the world, Mikhail Gorbachev tells his story. In this first of two programs, the untold tale of his rise to power. <laughs> Perestroika did win. We got democracy, we got freedom of speech and political pluralism. And we managed to end the Cold War. The bustling heart of St. Petersburg. Few today probably remember the significance of this spot for Gorbachev's revolution. It was here in St. Petersburg that Soviet citizens first grasped that their whole world was about to turn upside down. Right here in this square in May 1985, Mikhail Gorbachev broke with tradition and did what Soviet leaders had never done before. He bridged the gap between himself and ordinary people. It was unheard of. He was relaxed, accessible, even prepared to crack a joke. <laughs> the television pictures electrified the country. Here was a Kremlin leader, all right, a bit more energetic than those who'd come before, but still apparently a loyal communist who'd come up through the ranks. How come the system had suddenly thrown up this dissident from within? Gorbachev started out a typical product of the Soviet system. His childhood was spent here in Privolny, a sleepy village in southern Russia. His parents were peasants. In the harsh post-war years, he embraced Stalinism without question. I was a loyal citizen. And proof of that is that for my final exams, I chose Stalin as my subject. My theme was, Stalin is our glory in the battle. Stalin is the wings of our youth. It's not that someone dragged Gorbachev into the Communist Party, or that my father or grandfather insisted. Not at all. It all came from me. And it was the system that broadened his horizons by sending him to Moscow, to the top Soviet university. Then Stalin died, a political thaw took hold, and Gorbachev began to rethink his convictions. My doubts began towards the end of my time at Moscow University. Being a student in Moscow opened my eyes to many things. So much was bound up with Stalin. When I went back home to southern Russia and went into politics, I began to see how people really had to live. And I started questioning, questioning the whole system. This much vaunted planned system was channeling everything into the arms race while human beings fell a long way behind, living in poverty. Millions lived in poverty. Gorbachev wasn't alone. Critical thinking was in the air. 
especially after the Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev denounced Stalin. He provided the main impetus. There was a new sense of freedom, a feeling that it was time for new ideas. And he was the one to strike the first blow against Stalinism. The reform mood didn't last, but in private, Gorbachev's doubts continued, shared above all with his wife Raisa, for nearly 50 years his political confidant, till she died in 1999. One friend in particular stood out, Zdenek Mlinarch, a Czech student who later became the architect of the Prague Spring, Czechoslovakia's attempt to reform socialism. Zdenek was my dearest friend. He was closer to me than anyone else, Soviet, Russian or otherwise. And it stayed like that until he was sent home and the link was broken. Stenek was so clever, and it was my luck to be friends with him. Our positions coincided on many things. Linarch's reforms in the Prague Spring ended in disaster, crushed by Soviet tanks in 1968 on Moscow's orders. Gorbachev, by now a rising star in the Communist Party, endorsed the Kremlin line that the invasion was justified. But on a visit to Czechoslovakia a year later, he was in private turmoil. We arrived and it was shocking. People didn't want to talk to us. We'd assumed they'd wanted our support, including military action. That was what we'd been told, but it was disinformation. We visited a factory in Brno, and people turned their backs on us. It really hit me hard. We had insulted and humiliated a nation that was close to our hearts. Prague's crushed uprising left a lasting impression. Above all, Gorbachev concluded that any future reform must move slowly to avoid the danger of a backlash. Moscow's response to the Prague Spring had a huge knock-on effect for the Soviet Union. All the party meetings where there were harsh punishments for anyone who dared to deviate from the party line or raise doubts about the policy. In other words, a backlash and a clampdown. So when it came to Perestroika, I bore the lesson of the Prague Spring in mind. Moscow today is a far cry from the stifling control of the Soviet era. For Gorbachev, it was dangerous to voice criticism aloud. Instead, he spent the next decade climbing the party ladder. But he did confide in another young leading communist, his future foreign minister, Edward Shevardnadze. I said to him, everything is rotten and we need to change it all from top to bottom. We need to start a new life. He said, everything is rotten. He was very emotional. I said, I agree. But the main thing is, the next morning we woke up and discovered Soviet troops had entered Afghanistan and we hadn't known anything about it. Yet Gorbachev was playing two games, private criticism, but publicly an ambitious and loyal party functionary. This one-time farm boy and provincial boss from southern Russia didn't just leapfrog into a top job in the Kremlin. He was headhunted by powerful patrons in the Politburo. The 
encounter that sealed his fate was at this railway station, where the Soviet leader Leonid Brezhnev was arriving on holiday. Gorbachev, the regional party boss, was asked to welcome him. It turned out to be an informal vetting session. It was Brezhnev who summoned him to Moscow at the tender age of 47. But he wasn't the only one who hoped Gorbachev's youth and energy would reinvigorate the Politburo. Yuri Andropov, the feared KGB chief, had taken an early interest in him. When he became leader after Brezhnev died, he earmarked him as his successor. He said to me, I know you're in charge of agriculture, but don't forget a Politburo member should be able to deal with all subjects, including foreign as well as domestic policy. Because who knows what responsibilities might land on your shoulders tomorrow or the day after. And he said, do you understand what I'm saying? I said, yes. And he said, good. Well, off you go then. But Andropov's recommendation was ignored. The next Kremlin leader was 73-year-old Konstantin Chernyenko, so sick he looked like a living corpse as he tottered through his duties. Those opposed to reform had blocked Gorbachev. He saw it as a blessing, time to strengthen his position. If there hadn't been Chernyenko, as Voltaire said, we'd have had to invent him. I wasn't ready to take over, and I wasn't in the right frame of mind. It gave me time to get practical experience of being a leader, and to realize it was something I could do. Now, have you got enough? Thank you. A handshake. Madam, could we just turn to one left? Could we just turn and turn about? In London, Mrs. Thatcher may have bossed him and Raisa about, but she also met her match in Gorbachev. I had a good impression of her. I said to her, Mrs. Thatcher, I know you are a person of strong conviction, but bear in mind that you have another such person sitting in front of you. The most important thing I want to tell you is that I do not have instructions from the Politburo to invite you to join the Communist Party. She burst out laughing, it broke the tension, and we had an open and frank discussion. I saw in her someone with a broad and very good education and a breadth of views, but definitely an iron lady. 